All right, um, I'm Matthias Müller, and I am, you know, I'm kind of affiliated with two different places. I did my PhD also in Saudi Arabia at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. So part of me is also exotic. But just recently, I went back to Boring and went back to where I'm from, from Munich, as you might see. And I'm now with um, Interlabs. So let's get started. Um, for those of you who have no idea about machine learning or computer vision, I'll give you an introduction. Um, so basically, a few years ago, there was some AlexNet, which uh, was kind of a revolution, you could say, in computer vision. And you can see um, here is uh, recognition performance and object detection um, before deep learning. And we, we weren't really doing very well. But then in 2014, we we basically were introduced to a deep net that actually works, and um, the rest is history. So, I mean, this is uh, computer vision. So if you look at um, Papers with Code, which is a fairly popular website, um, you can see that there's now more than 600 tasks in computer vision that people work on. And, I mean, these are just a few examples. People are able to do uh, um, very well in object tracking, object detection, object classification, and so forth. And now, I mean, you will also see some work on human pose estimation and, and so forth. Now, what's after computer vision? A lot of this also went into machine learning. And you can see there's a little, like a few less tasks, but still quite a lot. Um, for example, if you've used Google Translate recently, you might have noticed that it has improved quite a lot and it's approaching a human performance now. Um, some of you might have heard of Netflix. Again, uh, the recommendation systems are largely based um, on machine learning. And um, it's also, it also turns out that machines are very interested um, in playing video games. So there has been you know, quite a bit of uh, recent work on playing games using machine learning. Now, uh, this is um, an example of the very popular DQN paper. Um, and you can see a lot of these classical Atari games um, are now being played by machines uh, rather successfully, um, even outperforming um, humans in, in a lot of uh, cases. Now, you might wonder what's next. Um, I personally think that um, robotics might be next. Um, I think um, a lot of progress that has been made hasn't really been seen in, in robotics very much yet. Again, if you go to papers with code.com, you see there's only about 13 tasks. Um, I think this is something that's bound to increase. Um, eventually, if you think about it, we are often talking about AI and machine intelligence, but at the moment, it just all runs on a screen. Um, how interesting would it be if all this intelligence is actually in robots that interact with us and the environment? So this is obviously not straightforward, but I think um, this is really a part of the future. And we already see some progress. We, we can see, you know, basically a, a robot-like thing learning to walk in simulation. Um, also, it's used for mapping and like uh, grasping objects. And if you are familiar with autonomous driving, Um, okay, there's like a, just some examples from uh, Visual Slam. Now, autonomous navigation, I think, is a hot topic that most of you might have heard of. I mean, this is a dream that goes back a long time. Mr. Bean really wished he had an autonomous car, but he didn't at the time, so he had to improvise. Um, also, um, package delivery is becoming a uh, more and more important topic. No one wants to go out to the store and actually look at things and buy them. People just want them to be delivered. So how cool would it be if we have a bunch of drones delivering packages? Now, um, there is already some progress. And so far, um, there was um, simulation that played a really big role. Um, some of the recent progress that has been made was largely in games and simulations. And like in particular, um, Google has done quite a lot. Um, they have defeated the Go champion. Also, I mean, chess champions have been defeated a long time ago, but um, Stockfish um, has been defeated as well um, by an AI. And I mean, there's also very complex um, and video games like StarCraft and so forth that have recently been maybe not solved, but where basically uh, um, machines were able to outperform humans. 
And now if you look at autonomous navigation, like these are two simulators um, from Uber and Google. And um, they are very largely used. Um, um, Google, for example, um, claim that 80% of all of the improvements they do in their fleet are done in simulation. So um, I think simulation is a very powerful and important tool um, to basically make machine learning algorithms work um, on physical systems. The, the question, of course, and this is something I'm going to talk about a little bit later, is if you now are able to do all of these things in simulation, how do you then transfer it to um, real platforms? So if you're not convinced yet, let me summarize again why um, simulation might be important. So first of all, um, in computer vision, machine learning, it's very important that we have annotated data. In simulation, since we actually create everything, we get all of this um, data for free, especially uh, pixel-wise annotation is very difficult to obtain, and in simulation we get it. Then also, um, we can now interact with the environment. Um, a lot of the tasks that have been very successful are based on large data sets um, that are annotated, but this uh, doesn't really work for a real system. A real system often needs to actually interact with the world and get feedback from the environment. This is something that we can do in simulation. Then also it's safe. Um, we, can, we can evaluate, um, for example, driving policies, but without risk. If we go out in the real world, we might be you know, killing people or doing crazy things that um, get us in the news. But in simulation, uh, we can just uh, click the reset button and, and no one was harmed. Um, also, um, hardware is often a constraint. Some people are not able to um, buy hardware or even if you buy some robotic system, it might be expensive and difficult to maintain and in simulation uh, you have none of that. You just download it, install it and you're done. And then also, um, it's a comparable setting. This is something that in, for example, object um, detection and recognition has been very important. We have some benchmark data sets where we can actually measure progress and compare algorithms in a fair setup. If you go out in the real world, everyone has slightly different weather. In Odessa, the sun is shining. In London, it's raining. In simulation, you can fix all of those parameters and you can uh, basically have a fair setting um, for algorithms to be compared. So, lastly, um, again, why simulation? Um, this is a, um, a psychologist from the US, maybe not so familiar, but he um, has a very interesting quote. He, well, what he basically says is that, in some sense, our brain simulates reality. So what we observe is oftentimes in some form of a simulation of what's actually happening around us. So this is maybe one more reason um, why simulation is useful and, and a good step um, to approach real systems. Now, um, for the, I'll quickly give you an outline of the talk. I quickly present um, a simulator that we have worked on, and then I'll present uh, three tasks that can benefit from it, and I'll give some intuition how uh, we can basically uh, solve or work on a task in simulation and then transfer the results to a real system. So let's um, start with the simulator. So this is um, a paper that we uh, published in a journal. And basically this started kind of, you know, with a very simple setting. We were interested in, in UAVs and doing object tracking from UAVs. So it, it turns out there is actually some really nice um, simulators um, or like a game engine such as Unreal Engine and Unity that people use to develop video games but they're actually really nice for research because you get realistic um, physics and graphics out of them. So we basically just downloaded this engine and started to, to integrate um, like API for C++ and MATLAB so we can work with it and, you know, like capture frames and whatnot. And like this is kind of some of the initial stuff we did with it. We basically ran some object tracking algorithms that people just uh, run on data sets and ran them in the loop in a simulation. Uh, you can see here, um, uh, for example, Meme was like a state-of-the-art tracker, but it's actually so slow that if you put it on a real system, it starts to oscillate a, a lot and doesn't really work in practice. Like Struck, on the other hand, is a very simple and fast tracker, and it turns out it actually works quite well. Um, so oftentimes, data sets are not really reflective of real-world performance. So. And this is an example uh, where we can see this. Now, in this simulator, 
uh, you can do a lot of things, and these are some of the applications um, that might be um, benefiting from a simulator. And the two that are highlighted here, object tracking and autonomous navigations, are two applications that we developed a little bit further in the simulator. And I'll talk about this a uh, little bit now. Now, to give you just some context, some related work on simulators. So, I mean, there are the Atari games that actually recently have become very popular again um, as a benchmark to, uh, you know, benchmark machine intelligence. A lot of them have been solved, but there's still a lot of Atari games that are very difficult, that are basically impossible by machines to solve um, until now. Then there's Gazebo, which is a very popular robotic simulator, often used in combination with ROS, not very photorealistic, but focusing more on the physics. Um, there's Muchoco, which has been very popular for reinforcement learning tasks, things like learning how to walk and so forth. Then um, more recently now, um, there is um, OpenAI Gym. It it's, um, has a lot of um, kind of interesting tasks as well and is used very commonly for re reinforcement learning. And then um, even more recently, Unity ML agents. So this is now actually an like, official kind of plugin from Unity to use the Unity engine um, with um, several tasks that are very popular um, for machine learning. Now, um, let's talk a little bit more about some photorealistic simulators. So there is, for example, X-Plane, and this is a very um, um, kind of popular and photorealistic um, simulation tool for airplanes. It even has like FFA approval. It's not really made um, for research, but some people have actually developed APIs for it. Um, there is a couple of uh, drone racing simulators that um, could be used and um, people have actually used modern video games such as um, GTA 5 and kind of hacked into it to, to get uh, depth and segmentation and so on and generated big data sets from that. Um, there is also AirSim, um, which was proposed by, by Microsoft using Unreal Engine and, and then Carla, which is for autonomous driving, um, again using Unreal Engine. And you can see a lot of um, these developments have happened very recently, and already we're seeing a lot of papers using these um, simulators. And yeah, where do we uh, kind of um, blend in? Uh, we proposed our simulator in 2016. By now we have kind of been overtaken uh, by the competition that has like huge teams onto it, like AirSim and Carla have teams of like 10 to 20 people behind them. Um, so they are being developed at a rapid pace. Now, you know, let me show you a few things that we did in, in our simulator. Um, here are a few features and, and you can see kind of the, the interface. So we have also airplanes, uh, UAV racing and autonomous driving in here. And as I briefly mentioned before, we have an interface to, so you can use like, like TensorFlow and, and what not to do some machine learning. You can basically get the, the, um, the images and state of vehicles, and then you can send back controls to um, control various vehicles in simulation. And uh, you can even integrate um, like VR systems and whatnot um, for visualization. Now, um, for the applications, I'll, I'll briefly t um, talk about object tracking. You can see some examples here, how this looks like. Um, then autonomous driving. And lastly, um, uh, drone racing. All right, so let's um, start with object tracking. Um, I'll, I'll be talking about um, the work called um, context-aware correlation filter tracking in particular. And again, for those of, who, um, of you who are not very familiar with object tracking, let me give you a quick introduction to it. So the task is the following. Um, we get some initialization in the first frame and an object of interest is uh, basically marked by a bounding box. And now what our task is, is to learn some sort of model um, that will update, that will represent this object. And then we'll try to localize this object using this model and we can either do like a sliding window where we just search across the whole image or we can do something a little bit more smart and have some object proposals and then eventually we apply this model that we have learned to identify the target and then update the model again. Now, there's a lot of um, interesting works in this field, 
But one thing that was quite um, interesting that was proposed already almost 10 years ago now are correlation filter and based trackers. They employ a really nice um, trick where and they basically use this base sample that you can see in the middle. And then they do um, uh, basically circle and shift, like they, I mean, they vectorize this image and, do, and then um, construct all circle and shifts of it. And you can see um, some of those shifts to the left and right. And, and by simply shifting this, um, this vector, you effectively translate the, the object um, throughout this patch. Now, what's nice about this is all of these um, shifted um, image patches you can put in, into a matrix, and this is now a circle and matrix, um, which has uh, very nice properties um, if you solve this problem in a specific way. And this is the setup. So this uh, nice circle and matrix is um, A0 here, and then um, W is basically a filter that you learn to apply to this. And it turns out that this um, rich regression problem um, can be solved very efficiently in the Fourier domain. And this is basically where this um, circle and uh, matrix structure comes into play. Um, in particular, um, in the Fourier domain, it turns out that this problem um, reduces to element-wise operations. Um, so you can um, basically now get a tracker that can run at like 500 frames per second. So, I mean, this was, a, was an extremely um, interesting um, work that has now probably close to a thousand citations. Um, it has a couple of issues though. Um, I mean, first, maybe the advantages, as I mentioned, it has a very efficient closed form solution along very fast tracking performance, and it's also um, quite good in general. But since there's very limited information about context, um, oftentimes these trackers drift um, if it gets a little bit more difficult. They're also very sensitive to fast motion since they're very much constrained to, to a small window and there's some issues with boundary effects. Um, as you can imagine, if you um, shift this image patch on, on the boundaries, um, you would now have, for example, half of the target on the left and the other half on the right. Um, so um, in here, um, what we wanted to do is basically solve some of these issues by incorporating um, some of this context. Um, but we would still like to, uh, to maintain this nice, efficient solution somehow. And I mean, how, I mean, how did we go about it? The idea is, is very simple. Rather than just having this um, simple base patch, we just sample additional patches um, around the target. So in here, you can see it as a grid. Um, they are um, right around the object patch here. And then intuitively, what we want now we want to learn a filter that does not only activate at the object we're tracking, but also um, does specifically not activate um, in background or context patches. And um, what do we do? This is the original optimization problem, where we basically regress um, this uh, filter applied to our object patch to a Gaussian response. And now we simply add a regularizer term um, where if we apply these context patches to the same filter, we want to regress this to zero. Um, so, you know, the idea is very simple, but it turns out this uh, works surprisingly well. Um, we can, again, solve this very efficiently. I'm not going to bore you with, with the details here, but you can basically solve this problem in either primal or dual domain and for single or multi-channel features. And for each of the cases, you can get a very efficient solution. For some of the more complex settings here, you need to apply a couple of tricks, but um, still you can do it. Now, there's a couple of pros and cons for solving it in, in each of those domains. Um, you can basically, for single channel features, you can maintain a, a really fast one-step solution. But, I mean, who wants to use single channel features? We all want to use, you know, like deep learning features or hog at least. So this is where the multi-channel features come in. And then the nice thing is by either solving it in the primal or dual domain, uh, we can trade off if we have like more context patches or um, higher channel um, features. Now, uh, let me just show you a couple of results. Um, uh, first of all, how do we measure performance here? We have two metrics, um, the precision rate and the success rate. The precision rate simply measures how far we are away from the ground truth. And the success rate measures the overlap between uh, ground truth and our prediction. And let's first look at the baseline trackers and then 
and basically the context aware adaptation where we uh, like basically add this context term um, so here are a couple of videos I mean you can see where we have a lot of background clutter like here um, adding this um, context term um, helps a lot and also here where we have um, fast motion or um, or here now let's look at a few more results and um, like these are now um, is basically a tracker that has um, like multi-channel features so it's already um, very good but some very difficult videos like the ones up here and um, you can see that the conventional one um, still struggles quite a bit um, and this is just you know to put the numbers um, into a plot so you can see in, in each of the cases and um, we are able to outperform the baselines by quite a margin now let's uh, compare to a few um, state-of-the-art trackers. Um, these are like you know some deep learning trackers and trackers that were state-of-the-art at the time. And again, you can see when there was like occlusion and, and so forth, and we are able to stay locked on the target. So now you might wonder um, again about the numbers. I mean, this is basically the table. At the time of the submission, we were top. By now, we are probably somewhere at the bottom. But you know, this is live. So um, the, the next step now, I mean, you might be wondering, like, what the heck? Like, why are you talking about object tracking? How does this relate to simulation or anything? Um, I'm going to show you now how you can uh, um, basically verify this for a real platform. So uh, what's the next step? Um, basically, we would now like to do some on offline evaluation first. If we want to put this on a drone, we want to get some idea how well this might work. So rather than using the, the, the common data sets that might not be reflective of, of what happens on a drone, um, we evaluated on this um, UAV data set that has sequences from an actual UAV. And there we can get some, some idea how this might work on a real system. Then the next step is um, we can now actually put it in the simulator and see um, how well it can track objects. And we can uh, visualize it here. We can see a lot of the state-of-the-art trackers, even though they perform really well on data sets, they fail very quickly because they're just too slow. And like our tracker here um, is, is a very simple tracker, um, but works fairly well. So it, it is actually able to track the object. Of course, you can also come up with, with any other tracker, but um, it turns out that oftentimes people just want to get high performance on data sets, um, but on a real system you have to trade off the speed and the performance. Now you can see here in, in simulation this seems to work uh, fairly well, but okay, this is just simulation. Um, so what happens on a real system? And you can see uh, we can now build a real system and put, put a tracker on the system here. Um, and, and again, this seems to work um, uh, reasonably well. So, so in here, we didn't really do like some real transfer learning that you might expect, and we simply went um, and looked into a simulator to get some intuition of what might work or what might not work on a real system, and then you could say we transfer this intuition to a real system. So um, let's talk about autonomous driving, where we use a slightly different approach to achieve this transfer, and this is based on, on these um, two works here. Now, um, first of all, if we look at autonomous driving, a very a popular approach has been end-to-end -end driving. Um, like NVIDIA has um, shown some very impressive results where they basically just train a car um, in an end-to-end -end fashion to just regress controls from images, and it turns out this car drives really nicely. Um, but if you now put this on a real system, there's a couple of issues. One, you need a lot of training data. This could be expensive to acquire. You need, like, you know, a big company, a lot of money to actually have a big fleet of cars that can collect this data. Also, now if you train this uh, driving policy, it's pretty much a black box. You give it an image, it will give you controls. How it does it, I mean, who knows? Um, this is something that uh, if you want to put it on a real system, it's maybe a bit dangerous. If it fails, you don't really know why. Also, um, to test such a system can be dangerous. To like if you test it in the real world and it makes a mistake, you know, we, we all know what can happen if we watch the news. Now, an, another issue in doing this end to end is that if you now come to an intersection, it's not really clear what such a policy should do. Um, should you go straight? Should you go left? Should you go right? If you just train it uh, completely end to end on some images, 
you know, it's, it's not clear. And even for a human, it's not clear if you come to an intersection, unless you know where you're going, someone has to tell you if you should go left or right. So this is the first thing that probably in industry has been addressed in some way, but not really in, in academia. So first to basically tackle this, um, we proposed um, conditional imitation learning, um, where quite simply you just inject um, a high-level command uh, from a planner, and then conditioned on this command, you, you now produce some controls for, for the vehicle. Um, but, you know, this is all nice. We can now train a policy end-to-end, -end, and we even have some conditional input to, you know, inject like Google Maps to say, okay, go right or left. But this is still has all these issues that I mentioned before, that it's like a black box and so forth. So what's our dream? Our dream is we want to do all of this um, in simulation where we can inspect the policy and get an understanding what it does, let it kill a couple of people, and then uh, we actually want to put it on a real system. And I mean, this is what we did here. I mean, okay, you can see, you can maybe put a baby on the car, but not much more. Um, but hopefully this would also scale to actually, you know, a big, big car. Now, there's a couple of problems. One is the virtual to reality gap. So even though these simulators are quite photorealistic and might look convincing if you play a video game, if you look a little bit more closely, um, you can see that simulated environments you know, are kind of a little bit monotone and boring. In the real world, you get like some crazy traffic jams, pedestrians, you get really crazy lighting conditions and reflections and so forth. So there's definitely a gap that we need to bridge somehow. And then also, um, controls are very sensitive and specific to vehicles. If you drive your car in the winter or summer, it's very different. In, in the winter, you might just you know, slip away. If you even just put different tires on your car, I mean, that's different. Or if you drive a Tesla or SUV, the steering is very different. So we somehow want to abstract this. If we just you know, do end-to-end, -end, we now train it on one car. It's not going to work on any other car. So there's a couple of related work. The most related work is actually this one from NIPS, Alvin. And this was proposed in 88, and yeah, this is maybe one of the most interesting work that has been done in the space, which is interesting because it happened 30 years ago, and this is actually when I was born. So, I mean, at this time I wasn't able to read the paper, but I did now. Um, so they actually, they did pretty much sim to real transfer, and they actually had a neural network uh, driving this car, uh, which is kind of crazy to think. So oftentimes we should maybe actually look back what people did 30 years ago because maybe they already did what we're doing right now. And I mean, this is a couple of more recent works. I mean, this is kind of a, you know, kind of a full uh, modular car stack, which is maybe something similar to what's being used in industry now. And then these are some uh, more recent works on like domain randomization and, and so forth. Now... Um, let's talk quickly about the pipeline. How do we um, go about solving this problem here? So first of all, we propose this kind of modular architecture where we try to abstract. So we have a perception module where we transfer the image to a segmentation. And the idea is that segmentation looks very similar in simulation and the real world. And this might not be, or well, this certainly is not the best intermediate representation. I'm sure we can come up with better representations, but the idea is this representation is a much more invariant to a lot of the, the issues that we have um, between simulation and the real world. And then the second level of abstraction is here. Rather than predicting controls directly, we predict um, trajectories encoded as a sequence of waypoints. And this allows us now to then have just a controller to, um, to produce the final controls, and we can now put this policy on, on different vehicles. So let's talk about the perception part first. So here we just go very simple. We just have two classes, road and not road, and we use a compact version of um, EarthNet, which is a pretty efficient um, semantic segmentation network um, that we can actually run on an embedded platform like the NVIDIA TX2. And then we basically train this on, on cityscapes with a whole bunch of um, augmentation. And you can see we get some results that are not going to win any benchmark, but they, they look reasonable. Um, you can see that in simulation, this actually performs pretty well. We can also see that there can still be quite a lot of noise. But it turns out this is actually not such a bad thing, because when we train the policy after this, 
um, this is some sort of natural way to do augmentation. It's um, going to learn to be robust to some sort of noise. And I mean, for the driving policy, this is very much um, similar to this conditional limitation learning that I mentioned earlier. So as an input, you get an image. In this case, it's basically a segmentation image. Um, you can add some measurements like the velocity of the speed, uh, like the velocity of the car. And then uh, in here, you inject the command, um, which is a high-level command such as turn uh, right or left at the next intersection. And based on this, um, the network then branches into different um, branches that are specialized on these maneuvers. Um, now, this is the trajectory. As, as I mentioned, we encode it as a um, couple of waypoints along this trajectory that we want to go along. And then the controller in this case is very simple. It's just a PAD controller, but I mean, of course, you could also learn this controller or do anything else you want. But it turns out that often uh, the most simple solutions might not get you a paper, but they actually work. And um, just a few more words about the training. So this is, again, the, the data set cityscapes for the driving policy. And we just use an autonomous agent. I mean, so basic simulation, another advantage that we have is that we have like access to everything. We are kind of God. So um, we can basically just use all this additional privileged information that we have, like where objects are and where the car is, and have a controller that can just drive the car for us. And this way we can get as much data as we want. Here, we just let the agent collect about 28 hours of driving data, and that was sufficient to get some reasonable performance that I wouldn't trust anyone to drive in, but, you know, that's good enough to get a paper. Um, just for the data augmentation, I mean, you know, this is often, like the devil is often in the details, so you can see we use a lot of augmentation, you know, like additional cameras to recover. Um, from mistakes, we inject noise, we change the, the field of view, we change camera height and pitch. So we do a lot of stuff that in simulation, again, is very easy to do um, because we can just change the sensor setup on the fly. In a real car, this would be tricky to do, like to just even moving the cameras, recalibrating them. But in simulation, we can just do all of these things. And this uh, leads to a much more robustness in the policy. Now. Um, this is experimental setup. Um, we first um, train um, and test everything in simulation. We have a specific setup here. We fix a weather and a city in the Carla simulator where we do all the training. And then we test it in increasingly difficult environments in simulation to see if we can actually achieve any kind of transfer before going to the real world. And, and these are some results. Uh, let's first focus on this one here. Um, this is basically just an end-to-end -end approach where you take an image and you produce controls. The plus indicates augmentation. You can see that in our training town we can perform well. I mean, this makes sense, so we basically just overfit. If we now try to transfer, this becomes very difficult. If we go to another town with the same weather that looks quite similar, we can still achieve reasonable performance. Well, I mean, I don't know if 20% is reasonable. But, you know, that's what we get. And if we now just change the weather, it completely fails. Uh, we can now use domain randomization. This works also quite well, I guess, in simulation. Um, but to be honest, for, for a real system that goes into outdoors, it doesn't really make that much sense because for the most part, the way domain randomization works is that you just randomize textures and then you basically try to um, just learn about the geometry of the environment and ignore textures. But as you can imagine, if you want to drive a car, this might not make sense because maybe it's useful to distinguish the road from the sidewalk. So in simulation, this works reasonably well, but you'll see that in a real system, this doesn't work. And then um, our method transfers reasonably well. You can still see that it, it doesn't achieve nearly perfect performance in simulation, but I mean, it's a start, I guess. Now, let's put this on a real system. This is the setup um, in here. And what we first do is we do a kind of a simple experiment where we initialize the car on a street um, in different positions facing away from the street. So basically what it has to do now is um, recover and then drive to the end of the street. Um, you can see that 
these baselines that go from images. Um, so first of all, like going from images to controls directly doesn't work at all. It crashes every single time. So at least it's consistent. Then if you um, predict trajectories, this works a little bit because as you can imagine, um, like the street looks maybe a little bit similar between simulation and the real world. So if you at least you predict trajectories, you can at least abstract the transfer of the controls that could be very different in simulation in the real world. But it's not very satisfying. Then domain randomization fails completely because now you basically completely um, forgot what's a street and what's a sidewalk. And the geometry might be quite different in the real world. And like our approach um, works quite well. And okay, you could say amazing, we got 100%, but I mean, if you look at the task, I mean, okay, uh, I wouldn't really be proud to get 100% here. Then we do a little bit uh, more complicated setting where we actually do navigation now. So we define three different routes of about a kilometer length with, with various uh, left and right turns. And um, you can see that we can actually achieve um, pretty good at performance. We're actually able to complete all of those um, uh, like uh, routes. And I mean, keep in mind that the policy was trained all in simulation. It has never seen the real world except for the cityscapes data set that was used for the perception network. So I think this is very promising. We still make mistakes. You can see that once in a while we missed a turn and had to reset the car. We have some mild infractions, uh, which means that we sometimes um, touch the sidewalk. There was one severe infraction, which means we hit a lamp pole. So, I mean, you know, this is not perfect, and um, this is clear, but I think by basically getting a better intermediate representation and more data, um, this is a very promising approach. And actually, there's already some startups that have um, now employed similar approaches on real systems. So that's um, quite exciting. Now, um, you know, let me just summarize real quick and there will be a little video playing to show some results. So we transfer a policy directly from simulation to the real world, basically using abstraction and, you know, like a modular network. And in particular, we have a perception um, network, then a driving policy and a controller. And this allows to easily transfer across environments and also allows to tune these modules individually and kind of look under the hood like what happens in each of those modules. I mean, as you could see, we first drove this car in Munich, like in Munich in the snow, and then we just shipped it to Saudi Arabia um, to a very different setting, and it turns out it still works. And I think this in itself is also uh, quite impressive. Again, it doesn't drive perfectly and it you know, looks a bit funny, but um, it actually works um, across environments. Um, so enough about um, driving cars. Um, let's talk about um, drone racing for a little bit and then um, wrap up before we run out of time. So th um, there's a couple of works that I'll uh, um, briefly touch on here. Um, now, you might wonder what is drone racing. Um, let me tell you. So the idea here, I'm not sure if you can see, but this is often what pilots see. It's, it's extremely noisy. Um, the idea is you have some video goggles where you get a live video feed um, from a drone, and then you have a remote control and try to navigate it. And this has recently merged into, into a sport where, where basically people even compete. There was a competition in Dubai with like $2 million uh, prize money. And you basically race at like more than 100 kilometers per hour trying to hit those um, racing gates. And these platforms, they just weigh like 500 grams, um, but you know, they're, they're pretty beasty. Now, um, why would you care about this? You know, it's all about the money for some people. I mean, not for me, but um, basically there was this uh, drone uh, um, racing league competition that's announced for autonomous drones. This will actually happen later this year. There was already like 200 teams that applied and I think 10 that qualified. And the idea is basically now to have an autonomous drone that can compete against uh, humans. And this is, you know, sponsored by like Lockheed Martin that seemed to be interested in that for some reason. Um, let me talk a little bit about related work. So there, in 2015, there was some work on having drones navigate in forest trails. Um, there was in 17 some work to do very aggressive flight maneuvers with UAVs passing through very tight gaps. 
and there was also some work to uh, to use drones uh, trained on a on a driving data set and then basically have a drone and follow the streets like a car would um, this is some work that maybe gets a little bit closer where basically I trained a, a policy to fly a UAV through gates um, they fly at one meter per second so I wouldn't call that racing but I guess it's a start and more recently uh, at Coral um, there was actually a work that is able to fly at like maybe nine meters per second so you know that's getting getting a bit closer at least and as you might have noticed before I mean why is this drone racing um, interesting other than you know just it being a fun thing it turns out that navigating through tight gaps and so on is actually very important for um, search and rescue missions. You know, if like building collapses or so on, it might actually be very useful to have policies that can be quick and maneuver through tight gaps. So I think there is actually, it, it's not only an re, um, interesting research problem, but it can have some uh, very useful applications that might or might not be developed by Lockheed Martin. Um, there is um, a setup and that we use in, in our simulator here. So we, we have um, this racing arena where we set up some racing tracks and fly a UAV. So this allows us, again, to generate large amounts of data, then uh, learn from it and evaluate. Um, uh, as for the environment, um, we actually, to um, try to make this transfer a bit easier, we actually uh, use a real football stadium, stadium in Kaust, and we and we do a 3D reconstruction of it by flying a drone um, that uses a combination of, of light and images. And you can see this is a rec reconstruction in the simulator, so I think it looks uh, fairly w good. It required some work. We basically had some help from a startup called Falconvis that spent about two weeks to uh, kind of fine tune it a bit. Now, we also designed a quick track generator where you can just plot kind of an overhead view of what the track should look like. To avoid, to avoid user bias, we downloaded a couple of images from the internet and just traced those. And this is the tracks that we um, came up with. We have seven tracks for training and seven for testing. Um, this is just, you know, like the data set that we came up with. So it's about 280,000 images. And in the first work, we looked at just doing kind of end-to-end -end learning like people have done for autonomous driving and look at the effects of augmentation. Like on a car, you just have the steering angle, so it's kind of obvious um, how you would do it. You maybe want to look a little bit to the left and right to do augmentation, but on a drone, you have a lot more degrees of freedom. So the way you do the augmentation uh, matters much more. Um, so we found there is kind of this sweet spot here um, where you have a couple of cameras um, looking left and right and a couple of cameras that are offset. Now, I mean, as I mentioned, we now, what we do here now, we just do some end-to-end -end learning like NVIDIA did and see how well this works for a drone. And you can see the network architecture here that we come up with is actually very compact. So on a, on a Titan X, it can run at like 500 FPS. Even on an embedded platform, it still runs at like 60 FPS or so. And this is some performance. I'll focus on the mo more difficult um, track four in the test set. Um, so you can see, we, I mean, we imitate different humans that basically were flying in the simulator, and then we just learn from the data. And for example, the yellow, it's an intermediate level human pilot, and then ours, and you can see, we can pretty much like imitate them. Um, Note, like we don't just overfit, we, like we actually evaluate on different tracks that have not been seen in training, but you could argue this still looks quite similar. And the same with the expert, we're also able to, to imitate the expert. We also compare to some baselines that also work reasonably well or, or fail in some cases. Um, here are some visualizations. Um, so you can see um, intermediate pilot and the network, and the same for the experts. So basically, we just learn to fly similarly as, as the human would. And just to make sure that the network has not learned bullshit, we just look at the filters here. And it turns out that those filters actually fire at places that we would expect them to fire at. Now, the question, of course, is can we do better? And the answer, like so often, is yes. So I'll quickly um, give you a few details about um, CFN. The idea is 
Uh, wouldn't it be nice to learn from multiple teachers rather than just imitating uh, a single teacher that might not be perfect? Could we learn from more than just one? This, we would hope, would lead to a policy that's more precise and faster. And also, can we maybe from, like we've seen in the autonomous driving, make this policy a little bit more modular so we can now adapt to different environments again? And this is the setup. We have two teachers here. We have a conservative PID controller that flies very precisely, makes every single gate, but is really, really slow. And then we have a very aggressive PID controller that flies really fast, but makes a lot of mistake, like keeps hitting the gate or overshooting. Um, you can see both of these teachers have a big butt, like butt flies very slow, but makes mistakes. What we would like to do here, we would like to be in the no butt zone. Now, how do we do this? <laughs> this is uh, our approach. So the idea is we just want to fuse like a couple of trajectories from different teachers in here. And we just want to combine the good behavior and basically disregard the, ba um, the bad behavior. And then the modularity part, we want to again um, kind of abstract the control. And in here what we do is we train a perception network that predicts a trajectory. We then fuse the trajectory with the state of the UAV. And then we learn this network here. And this controller fusion network basically takes as input these uh, um, trajectories and then uses those two teachers um, as some sort of supervision to learn from each of the teachers the good um, behaviors in order to uh, um, produce reasonable controls. Now, um, this is the encoding of the waypoints. The setup here um, for learning is that you have these two teachers um, that basically control the UAV. You put the, these trajectories into a buffer and then with uh, some reward, you measure how good these are. And once a UAV crashes, you clear the buffer so you don't add this to your data set. And then both of these teachers will add to a database um, from which you learn in an online fashion. So as these teachers explore, you add more and more samples to this database buffer from which you now train your control network. And this is kind of how it looks like. You know, you have some trajectory here. You don't really know what's going to happen here. And as you roll it out, you will add, you will know, okay, this was good. And then you take this trajectory and add it to your database. Here, the UAV flies out. And then in the future, you will know, okay, these were bad samples. So if this happens, you clear your buffer and you will not add this trajectory to your database. So again, a pretty simple idea. And now if we look at some of the results, you can see the conservative one it flies very slow and precise, as we would expect. The aggressive one really fast but makes mistakes and then our policy here um, is able to learn um, some sort of a fusion of the two. Um, if we compare it to a couple of humans, um, you can see that we are more or less as good as an intermediate human pilot but we are still quite far away from a professional racing pilot. Um, this is just to put it in numbers. Um, again, um, we are actually able to uh, get 100% score and, and a reasonably good um, time. Now, the interesting thing here is now how do we transfer? So in this case, we didn't transfer to a real platform yet, um, which is not so easy to do. Since I finished a PhD, I don't know if I'll ever get a chance to do it. So maybe one of you can do that. Um, we just do transfer to different environment conditions and simulation. Um, and uh, you can see we can either change the weather conditions or even the textures. And depending on um, what we change, we can now do different ways to adapt. So we can just do direct transfer, where our policy, basically just based on some augmentation, is, is able to adapt to the new environments without any fine tuning. Or if we do some significant changes, like we change the texture completely, like the snow or mud texture, we can now just take the perception part, retrain it, for the new texture and then the controller that we learned, um, we can just keep it the same and plug them back together and you can see this works really well. The idea would now be to do something similar in the real world where you basically just train the perception um, network on real data and you can keep the controller that you used in, in simulation. You might still have to do some fine tuning of course to account for the difference in physics between simulation and the real world but this would kind of be the idea. So let's just put this on a map. Um, like we are up here, which 
uh, I mean, well, the green is where we would like to be eventually, which means you're very fast and also like very precise. At the moment, we are somewhere up here. Now, there's still a lot of limitations um, in this work. So the teachers need to be selected very carefully so they complement each other. It's very sensitive to hyperparameters such as this buffer size. Then, again, the learning requires a lot of tricks that are not in the paper but on the slides. No, I think they might even be in the paper. But, um, yeah, when do you stop training? Uh, you know, the order of the teacher even matters. If you first learn the fast and then the slow one, you might become slower. And also, different trajectories that we sample um, could be from the same state. So this will make it difficult for the network to learn. Now, again, can we do even better? Yes. And I want you to meet oil. And I'm was in Saudi Arabia, so you might think this, but no, this is not OIL. OIL stands for Observational Imitation Learning, and this is basically inspired very much by reinforcement learning, um, trying to combine imitation and reinforcement learning in a better way than just doing this trajectory fusion. The idea is that you have a, whole, like a large pool of teachers that you observe, and then you pick the best teacher, and then you basically do some sort of um, uh, rehearsing, just like you would teach your kids. You, for a given uh, part, you pick a teacher and then you rehearse until the policy is able to outperform the teacher on that part. And, and then you basically um, you act it out. You use the policy to um, roll out um, the trajectory to go to a new state. This is how it looks. I mean, we again do this modular perception control network and have this uh, joint loss. And I'll show you just a comparison, how we compare to a teachers and human performance, and then some state-of-the-art baselines such as Dagger and DDPG. Um, so these are the results for, for drone racing. Um, you can see that we are able to outperform all baselines, teachers, and uh, humans. The nice... Uh, oh, time out. Yeah, there, on this slide is a lot of videos, so... So maybe we need a, a GPU. <laughs> it's almost over. Like the suffering will come to an end in five minutes. So. So, yeah, this is some video that should show the, the drones uh, flying, which they look a bit static, I'm not sure. Oh, let me try again. All right, let's try again. Yeah, I mean, it seems the UAVs are not very motivated to fly. So, like it turns out, you can also apply this to uh, autonomous driving. So I'll just show you the results there. Um, basically, you can see here the different teachers. So these are like, some uh, random PAD controllers and how they drive. And you can see a lot of them a little bit crazy. And, it, it, you know, they like to drift and do all these kinds of things. But basically, by, by using some sort of a reward function, we can combine them and come up with a teacher that's basically faster than most of them um, and doesn't learn this bad stuff. Now, we can also compare it to, to some human drivers. This is like an expert driver. And, uh, again, you can see that we can outperform most of these human drivers. And we can actually drive much more precisely um, than a human driver. And uh, lastly, let's um, have a look at some um, learned um, policies. You can see, for example, um, Dagger. And then DDPG is based on reinforcement learning, so random exploration. So you can see, you know, it looks a little bit drunk. So maybe this guy already was at the after party, or just didn't really know how to sample. 
and behavior cloning uh, basically just clones behavior, so that's no good. Now let's uh, summarize. So I showed you a couple of uh, ways to do sim to real transfer. In object tracking, we just use our intuition that we gained in simulation and then put it on a real system. In autonomous driving, we did the abstraction of the perception so we can easily transfer the perception part and the, in the driving, we, lear we learned the control policy and then transferred the controller. Um, there are some acknowledgements. So I did this work while I was at Kaos. So there's a really amazing um, uh, group of people, including um, Adel back here. And I had a lot of um, collaborators um, in these works. And I'd also like to thank my family because without family, life is no fun and you don't do anything interesting. And um, I think that's the end. So if you have any questions or discussion, um, I'm happy to answer questions. Yep. Maybe I'll keep it. Yeah, thank you, Matthias. Does it work? Okay, so if any questions, please. Hi. Hi. Hello, I'm Yuri. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question. Um, if I'm right, I know that in Antonio, Antonio, autonomous driving, in reality, they use like other sensors, like lidars, mm -hmm. and they use. I know there are some projects that create maps for autonomous driving, and uh, they use data from other machines that on on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to incorporate all this data in simulation? And is there some projects for that? Yes, um, you can actually incorporate all of those sensors. Also, I mean, for example, in the Carla simulator, there is also a LiDAR simulation and simulations for a lot of other sensors. So, yes, you can certainly do that. I mean, in our case, we were more interested to have kind of a simple setup, just like a camera. Like, you know, people like Elon Musk uh, firmly believe in you can just use a cheap sensor like a camera. But, of course, uh, especially for current systems, using some maybe more reliable sensors uh, m might be useful, yeah. Okay, thanks. So actually, um, I actually have a question on the modular versus end-to-end um, -end driving. So someone like Alex Kendall, who, well, who has a startup Wave yeah. AI, I think. Mm -hmm. So he's pushing a lot for end-to-end -end driving, even though his own academic kind of track record is a lot on geometry, semantics, mm. so something that could serve as good intermediate representations. Yeah. So, like, what, 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 what's your take, like, going, going forward? Because, like, in, in his case, is it, is it he's trying to sell his company or d d does it really has it has a end-to-end -end driving has its own merits? Yeah. So... <laughs> So Alex, I mean, he's actually using conditional limitation learning, but like the end-to-end -end version of it. And I mean, it, it can definitely work eventually. Um, it, and I mean, it has certain benefits, of course, because if you, if you learn end-to-end, um, -end, um, you are actually optimizing for the task. If you do these different mod modules, you know, it might sometimes not be the optimal um, thing to do. But for end-to-end, -end, you need a huge amount of, of data. And it, it might um, also make it much more difficult to understand what the policy is doing. I mean, you can do some like visualization of feature maps and so on, but you don't really know what's going on. Also, by uh, like you know, if you develop a system at scale in a company, usually things are always developed in in modules. So also from that point of view, it makes sense to work on different modules. And then as progress happens in these different tasks that are already computer vision tasks, anyways, you can kind of replace those modules and can maybe also provide some form of guarantees for these different modules. So, I mean, there's different school of thoughts. Most of the big companies, they definitely uh, um, do modular approaches, also like Uber. I mean, Alex is a firm believer in end-to-end, -end, and I guess the future will tell what's the best approach. But just a very quick follow-up, there's also actually some theoretical work that shows for some simple problems um, that end-to-end -end is, is not like a very sample efficient and basically having this model of structure is much more sample efficient. Yeah. Yep, and there are also regulations in automotive like functional safety which doesn't allow you to, to not to know what's inside. Oh, no. 
Uh, when doing when doing this uh, randomized data augmentation mm -hmm. in, the, in the in the autonomous driving uh, context, are you kind of just uh, heuristically inventing what you're going, what type of augmentation you're going to do, or is there some conceptual approach for that? Yeah, to be honest, this is is pretty much heuristics. Like these. Uh, the most of this augmentation is based on what, what you think makes sense or what people have shown in the past that works. Um, there is, like now there's more and more work also where people use, for example, GANs, um, in trying to specifically produce um, augmentation that, that makes training better. But to be honest, I don't think, like for sure there's no like theoretical guarantee what augmentation should be better than others. So for the most uh, part, it's you know like luck, and you know you try some things, you pray a little bit, and you know hope for the best. <laughs> yeah. What do you think about the application of this approach in maritime field? For example, so-called MESS project, maritime autonomous surface ships. Mm -hmm. Very close tasks, but absolutely another expenses and uh, speeds and so on. Mm -hmm. So you mean in particular using uh, like simulation to learn some policies? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it, it, it's very interesting. I mean, um, you can definitely also use simulation there. I know there is actually some underwater in environments as well, like an Unreal Engine and so on. But I think this is much less developed um, because now you know, like autonomous driving and so on, it's like a hot topic. So so many people contribute, and there's assets and so forth available for simulation. But in principle, it can also be um, used for those tasks. And I think, as you pointed out, like cost is a really big factor, and it might make sense to invest a little bit to have a nice simulation. Yeah. Okay, two more questions. Thanks. Thank you for the nice, interesting talk. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, my question is: um, so if you are so st if you are struggling from moving from simulation um, to reality, mm -hmm. uh, what if you think in reverse way? Uh, can we learn uh, a kind of a, a compact space representation from reality to simulation and do our uh, tasks in, simula in this simulated reality? Mm -hmm. And uh, do you know any works on this direction and uh, do you s see that this is feasible? Yeah, yeah it's um, a very good question and I think it's very interesting. I've also actually become a bit interested in this to now do transfer from reality to simulation. And um, so there is some work where basically um, they use a GAN, like a cyclic GAN, to go between simulation and, and the real world. I think this was published at um, ECCV 18. So then the idea is rather than having, for example, the segmentation as your intermediate representation, you could have a representation that looks a little bit like simulation, but it's a specific kind of simulated look that you produce by the GAN and going back and forth between reality and simulation. So I think that definitely makes sense. And in general, like to go back from reality to simulation, I think is uh, makes a lot of sense. And I think people have not really explored this very much. So if you're interested in this, this might be a good uh, direction to go into. Just make sure that the other guys here will not do it. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, first, thank you for your talk. Uh, so have you tried your end-to-end -end system in case of presence pedestrians or traffic on the road. Mm -hmm. So this is the most difficult thing for yeah. end systems to handle in case of autonomous driving. Yeah, yeah so um, uh, vehicles, like we have tested in simulation to do like, uh, like avoidance of vehicles and so on, and this uh, works reasonably well. In, in the real world, we haven't done uh, much of these tests. Um, so actually, when we did the training simulation, we turned a lot of these things off to keep it a little bit more simple. But in principle, it's definitely possible. Pedestrians in particular are very hard because they're kind of fast and dynamic objects. So in some initial experiments that we tried, uh, we were hitting people. So <laughs> that's, that's not so great. But I think in principle, it's, it's definitely possible. It will just require a larger amount of data and maybe also the way that you build a network. You might want to have an additional object detector to specifically actually detect um, pedestrians. 
Um, yeah, so this is definitely like to make a system like this actually work on, on like on a real platform and like not kill people and do all of those things. Um, I think still requires a, a good amount of effort. So, do you have any embedded safety checks uh, which guarantees that you won't hit, uh, for example, a pedestrian? I know that uh, these mm -hmm. uh, things have, uh, are present in a traditional modular approach. Mm -hmm. No, like in, in this work, um, we don't, no. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, colleagues, any more questions? Okay. Hi, first of all, uh, thank you for outstanding sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my question is, uh, you mentioned that you have driving policy module in mm -hmm. uh, self-driving cars architecture. And uh, the question is, uh, how, uh, how much your uh, system depends on uh, these rules? I, I guess it's rules-based. Mm -hmm. like policy, so uh, how much if-else architecture is in your code? Mm. Yeah, so uh, surprisingly uh, the code doesn't really have uh, almost any if-else, uh, like all of the modules themselves are, are learned and then they're just kind of concatenated, so there's a module um, that basically is just a segmentation network to transfer real image to a segmentation image and then this is input into a second network that uh, predicts the trajectory. And then you have a PAD controller that follows this trajectory. So the PAD controller, there's like a little bit of if, else, and tuning, but the other two modules are, are just trained. And again, you, you don't, like in this approach, you don't really have like, like guarantees um, or anything like this. You can maybe get a little bit more intuition why things go wrong because you can specifically analyze, for example, the segmentation output and if you see that segmentation is really bad, you have some idea that, oh, maybe the perception didn't really work so well. And then if the trajectories that are produced are very noisy, then you have an idea, oh, maybe the driving policy wasn't working so well. So it's still like nowhere near perfect, but it's a little bit easier to analyze the separate modules than just the whole stack where you just get some controls and you have no idea like where they came from. Yeah. One, two, three. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Thank you for your speech, very interesting. I'm curious uh, about autonomous vehicle part. Um, mm -hmm. I saw that uh, your small uh, car driving around the city, and I'm mm -hmm. curious how how you dealt how how did you deal with this actually going on the streets and letting your vehicle to drive because there could be like another vehicles, uh, people driving and stuff like that. Yeah. So I mean, well, I'm not sure if. Let me show you maybe the video for if I can get back in. I mean, basically, as you might see in a minute in the video, okay, it doesn't work, but I mean, anyways, in the video you saw this little guy like running next to the car, that was me, with a remote control, like just being ready to take over. And there was a couple of incidences where basically a, a car was driving by, and especially in the beginning I wasn't so confident, so I would like turn the car off. And I mean, also this is so. This is like an RC car, like scale one to five. So maybe like I don't know, this big. So in the worst case, yeah, like a car will just drive over and it's it's broken. I mean, it's fine. But yeah, I mean, it was tested like not like in the middle of the city and kind of some you know back roads where it could just be a little kid driving an RC truck. You know. Yeah. Okay. More more questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, coming back. Coming back to the uh, tracking option, uh, how do you restart the position if uh, speed uh, highly increased? So if our tracking object uh, move really faster than we expect, how do you restart the position of this object? Yeah, yeah. So at the moment, like, so so in this uh, framework, um, we don't actually estimate the speed of the object. So the the, the window, your search window is initialized at the previous detection, so it just depends how big um, your search window is. But uh, what you could do is that you just um, employ a, a, like a simple motion model, so you'd maybe just take the difference between co consecutive frames 
so when you initialize your search, um, you are a little bit closer to um, uh, where the vehicle was before. And uh, what's going on exactly in the context aware? So yeah. when we're analyzing uh, all frames around uh, our current object and uh, what's yeah. going on if our object is anywhere else on the image? So if the object is anywhere else or completely out of the image, it will fail. Like the, it doesn't have, I mean, you could engineer an additional module to detect that if the object is gone and then you do a search on a complete image, but we didn't do this here because in all of the data sets and even when you usually track an object, this doesn't happen very much. But the big problem of um, fast motion occlusion is usually that if you don't have this uh, context, once your object is occluded or far away, you will update your model uh, with some background, and that's bad. By having this context, you have basically learned uh, the context around the object, and your filter has learned that like, this, this is definitely not the object. So now if the object is for a short time occluded, or it has moved really fast, uh, you will not update your model because you will not, um, your filter will not fire in the context because in previous frames it has learned that this is definitely background. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks for your talk. And uh, have you tried fine tuning your model trained on this limited simulated data, limited number of textures, probably mm -hmm. simplified physics? and then uh, use like real-time end-to-end uh, driving to, to kind of squeeze extra few points. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so we didn't try it here specifically because we actually uh, tested the car in many different environments and it's quite expensive to collect all this data. Um, but in the previous work's conditional imitation learning, this is actually what we did. We collected a, a lot of real data and uh, like in the environments that you collect the data, the car drives really well. So by the same logic, I mean, you could definitely collect some data and then fine tune, but fine tuning is always a bit of a tricky thing because it's not clear like how much data do you need, how do you tune your learning rate. It's, it's definitely possible, but it requires some tuning. But the idea is that you learn most of your uh, you do most of your training on simulated data with very limited yeah. Actually, everything with, with is in simulation. Data, and then fine yes. tune on a very limited data set to... Yeah. Yeah, this definitely makes sense for like, employ like deployment, but here we were mainly interested, just like kind of in the academic part of it, can we transfer this? Like on a, I mean, uh, I definitely wouldn't trust my kids to drive in this car. I mean, uh, I'm telling you, like, <laughs> it's not safe. Okay, we have a time for the very last question. Is there any? Okay, thank you, Matthias. Don't go. We have also uh, two two books. This Avasa Madessa, oh, this nice. year edition, and one is unconditional for you. Ah, thank you. <laughs> and uh, also, please pick up uh, one of the best questions, uh, and this best question will get this book. Uh, yep, there's a guide for Odessa. Yeah. I really like the question of I'm going the reverse way from uh, reality to simulation. Uh huh. Is this the last one? It, no, it was, uh, I can point, I don't want to blind you, but <laughs> uh, the guy with the nice beard. Okay. <laughs> okay, please, thanks for this book. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you. Thank you for your talk.